A former U.S. Marine Corps fighter pilot reportedly tied to a Chinese hacker, now arrested in Australia. Washington sweeping China sanctions meet with a twist. Several major U.S. semiconductor makers are still sending microchips to China. Germany's chancellor visiting China. The trip among the most controversial to the country by a German leader. A $17 billion deal olive branch extended from China to European aircraft giant Airbus. TikTok admitting it shared European user data with workers in China. And Canadian broadcaster CBC closing its bureau in Beijing. That's after trying and failing to get Chinese work permits for its journalists for two years. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. New details on the former U.S. Marine Corps fighter pilot arrested in Australia last month because of his work in China. Two aviation sources told Reuters that Daniel Dugan went to Beijing in 2013 and 2014 to work with Stephen Su, a Chinese hacker and businessman. Here's more. Former U.S. Marine Corps fighter pilot Daniel Duggan used the same address in Beijing as Stephen Su, a Chinese hacker. In 2016, Su pleaded guilty to hacking the computer networks of U.S. defense contractors and sending sensitive data back to China. The shared Beijing address is listed in Australian company filings. It's unclear whether they used the address at the same time. Duggan's lawyer said that the former military pilot denies having breached any U.S. law, any Australian law, any international law. Duggan is a former U.S. citizen. He was arrested in New South Wales in October. Australian federal police took him into custody on request from Washington, and he now faces extradition back to the States. Duggan is currently being moved to a maximum security prison in New South Wales. His case will return to court in late November. Duggan's arrest came shortly after Britain warned dozens of former military pilots to stop working in China or face prosecution on national security grounds. The UK says its military pilots, both current and former, are being lured into China by large payment offers. After they arrive, they're asked to train the country's armed forces. Chenny Wu, NTD News. A twist on Washington's sweeping technology restrictions. The rules limit selling semiconductor technology to China. But several major microchip makers, including Intel, say they are still able to send chips to China. That's because they've gotten exemptions. Here's more. Before we dive in, here's the background. Last month, the U.S. came out with its broadest crackdown on China's access to advanced U.S. microchip technology. Under the new rules, companies can't sell advanced computing chips or chip-making equipment to China unless they get a license. On top of this, the U.S. would also prevent companies around the globe from selling AI and supercomputing chips to China if those chips are made with U.S. technology or machinery. The sanction also bans U.S. persons from supporting China's chip development and production without a license, namely green card holders, citizens, and all people living in the U.S. The moves aim to slow China's military development because semiconductors or microchips are essential for military capability. Microchips are the brains and hearts of weapons, ranging from fighter jets to nuclear arms. Here's an example of how the Chinese military relies on microchips made with U.S. technology. In artificial intelligence, China is getting close to America's level. But some of China's most advanced supercomputers rely on microchips from Intel and TSMC. Both firms use U.S. technology to produce those chips. That's according to a report from The New York Times. But Washington's new ban is meeting with a new twist. Several major chip makers have announced they've received exemptions to the ban. That includes Intel, TSMC, Samsung Electronics, and SK Hynix. All of them have received one-year exemptions to get U.S. chip-making equipment, so their microchip plants in China can continue production. Germany's chancellor is visiting Beijing briefly. It marks the shortest trip ever by a German leader to China and could be the most controversial. Olive Schultz is facing criticism from Western allies and within his own government. There are concerns the visit is shoring up Chinese communist leader Xi Jinping's legitimacy and boosting Germany's economic dependence on China. Here's a closer look. 
It was the first visit by a Western leader to China in three years. Though German Chancellor Olaf Scholz had to limit his trip to 11 hours due to China's strict COVID policy. Communist leader Xi Jinping, who recently tightened his grip on power, received Schultz at Beijing's Great Hall of the People. Deep trade ties bind Asia and Europe's biggest economies, so Schultz brought with him several top German business leaders. The German Chancellor's visit has fueled concern among allies that Germany would continue to prioritize economic relations with Beijing over security, as well as human rights. In an op-ed published before his trip, Schultz stressed that Berlin needs to change the way it deals with Beijing. He wrote that Germany needs to reduce risky dependencies but doesn't want to decouple from China. Schultz said Berlin would seek cooperation where it lies in both countries' interest, but that Berlin would not ignore controversies. That's especially true for the topics where we don't share the same belief such as on human rights or the question of what perspectives Taiwan has. But it's also about economic development. And here, we are determined that there will be a level playing field. Schultz said during the meetings with Xi and the Chinese Premier Li Keqiang, he stressed Germany's position on Taiwan. It was our... I made clear that any change of the status quo of Taiwan can only happen peacefully and by mutual agreement. Schultz said he urged Xi to exert influence on Russia to end the war in Ukraine. Both condemned the use of atomic weapons in Ukraine, but Xi did not condemn the invasion. Prominent activist and politician from Hong Kong, Nathan Law, criticized Schultz's visit. He said the trip risked sending mixed messages over the Ukraine invasion and giving legitimacy to the Chinese leader. So for me, it's, it's definitely um, giving a lot of um, opportunity for Xi Jinping to see it as a badge of honor, to see it as a means to de dismiss uh, the, the unity of free world and silently to decrease pressure for Russia. Um, I think this is such a bad move. Law said Schultz should remember that China continues to be Russia's biggest partner. The European Union's foreign policy chief is sharing a word of caution about China. Top diplomat Joseph Borrell says it is clear that China is consolidating a new era of its external policy, and internal also, that China is becoming much more assertive, much more on a self-reliant course. He added that Western democracies want to reduce their dependencies on China. But for the time being, many EU member states have a strong economic relationship with China. Borrell noted he does not think countries can put China and Russia on the same level. The same day Germany's chancellor visited China, China and aerospace company Airbus struck a $17 billion deal. It appears as an olive branch from China to the European aircraft giant. And Germany is home to one of Airbus's headquarters. China's state aircraft agency confirmed it would buy 140 planes from Airbus. Months before the deal, China's big three state airlines pledged to buy over 290 Airbus jets. The offer was the biggest from Chinese carriers at the time, since the COVID-19 pandemic broke out. The new deal marks a breakthrough for the European aerospace giant. That's as Airbus's U.S. rival Boeing remains partially frozen out of China. Beijing hasn't announced any orders from China since 2017. That's following the fatal Boeing 737 MAX crashes, plus ongoing tensions between Washington and Beijing. China is the world's second largest aviation market. Boeing projects its worth at over $1 trillion over the next two decades. Boeing told investors it could reach its goals without the Chinese market. With the German chancellor visiting China, some officials from other countries are also lingering in the region, but they are steering clear of being inside China directly. For the first time, a current U.S. Federal Communications Commissioner is visiting Taiwan. During meetings with Taiwanese officials this week, Brendan Carr focused on cybersecurity and telecoms, showcasing U.S. support for the island. He's also holding meetings in Shinshu City, home to Taiwan's microchip industry, something Carr called an indispensable part of the U.S. supply chain. He also noted a free and democratic Taiwan is vital to America's own prosperity. 
Carr is one of five FCC commissioners. The U.S. has no official diplomatic relations with Taiwan, but Washington is bound by law to provide the island with the means to defend itself. China claims the island as its own and has never ruled out using force to take it over. The Chinese Communist Party has never ruled the island, and Taiwan says its sovereignty claims are void. On top of his other remarks, Carr also suggested banning Chinese-owned social media app TikTok, citing security concerns. Carr told American news outlet Axios earlier this week that he doesn't believe there is a path forward for anything other than a ban. In the U.S. alone, the app has been downloaded more than 200 million times. Teenagers or young adults make up most of its active users. TikTok back in the hot seat. The company admits to sharing European user data with workers in China and other countries. NTD's Sean Marshall has more. TikTok is sharing European user data. TikTok made an announcement as part of a privacy policy update released on Wednesday. It names China as one of a number of countries where user data can be remotely accessed by the company. This comes amid a year-long investigation by Europe's General Data Protection Regulation into data being shared with China. Other countries where European user data could be accessed by TikTok staff are Brazil, Canada, Israel, the U.S., and Singapore. Sean Marshall, NTD News. Support for Taiwan is also coming from Europe. A group of lawmakers from different countries arrived in Taiwan this week. The politicians are looking to boost bilateral trade ties with the island. Two of them are sanctioned by Beijing. They met with Taiwan's foreign minister Thursday. Here's more on what they discussed. Taiwan is not to be isolated, but that contracts will only increase, that we will not be intimidated, that we'll be coming over more often, and that our relations and our friendships are not to be determined by others. The eight lawmakers are from Ukraine, Germany, the UK, Kosovo, Czech Republic, Belgium, and the Netherlands. They are the first delegation of the International Parliamentary Alliance on China to visit Taiwan since the alliance was founded in 2020. Taiwan's Foreign Minister Joseph Wu handed the alliance co-chair Reinhard Butikofer a grand medal of diplomacy. Butikofer spoke through a video call from his hotel room due to testing positive for COVID-19 when he arrived in Taiwan. Beijing put Butikofer on its sanction list last year after the European Union sanctioned several Chinese officials involved in suppression of Uyghurs in China's Xinjiang region or East Turkestan. The Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, or CBC, is shutting its news bureau in Beijing. The announcement came Wednesday, after the broadcaster waited two years for a China work permit for its journalists. The publicly owned news outlet had numerous exchanges with Chinese officials in Canada over the past two years about visas, but to no avail. A letter sent in April to China's ambassador to Canada was acknowledged, but not followed up on. The decision comes months after CBC News was forced to shut its Moscow bureau by Russia's foreign ministry. That was in response to a Canadian ban on state TV station Russia Today. The expulsion occurred after a 44-year presence in Moscow. CBC says it will search for a new location to cover East Asia over the coming months. Meanwhile, Radio Canada will station its journalists in Taiwan for the next two years. Wear and tear, that seems to be Beijing's strategy towards Taiwan. The most eye-catching example, sending an overwhelming number of fighter jets into Taiwan's air defense identification zone. How can Taiwan stand up to its communist neighbor? We hear from Kelly Sloan, Senior Fellow in Energy and Environment of the Centennial Institute. Kelly, it seems when it comes to Taiwan from an outside perspective, it almost seems like there's an imminent war coming from Beijing. But you were just there recently. So what was the vibe like on the ground? What was the mentality there? So uh, they've been dealing with this their, their entire lives. So and they have the mentality that you can't worry about it all the time or you won't get anything done, right? Um, they're proud people. They're very proud of what they've accomplished on, on their island, as they should be. It's this little economic miracle uh, in, in Asia. And Kelly, with Beijing sending all of these fighter jets near Taiwan, what's your take on Taiwan's response? Will they fight? Those are happening daily. They're, it's so commonplace, it's not even reported anymore. Uh, but one thing that's important to know about that is you know, Taiwan has, I think, somewhere in, in the range of about 120, maybe 140 F-16 uh, fighter planes. That's not a whole lot. And it's the same planes and the same pilots every day going up to intercept uh, these, these Chinese planes and pilots. And they're doing it there, and they're doing so effectively. But 
that's a huge wear and tear on men and machinery. China, in, uh, meanwhile, has a large enough inventory of, of fighter planes and pilots. They're probably sending new, new planes, different pilots up every time. So they're not having that same strain. So they're, what they're doing with these incursions, uh, it's not just thumbing their nose at, uh, at Taiwan and world order. They are fully wearing down the, uh, you know, the uh, morale and the, uh, even the, the capability of, of the, of the planes. You know, every time they go up, that's more wear and tear on, on the engines and the airframe and, and everything else. And Kelly, in America, we do have this strategic ambiguity in regards to Taiwan. And you write in one of your papers that there should be some clarity around that. So what is that level? Is it actually sending troops on the ground there or what's the level of our defense? Well, I think eventually we may, uh, you know, if we did make have a military treaty, a proper military treaty with Taiwan, uh, which we should have, uh, yes, we probably have some troops based there. But again, it's not going to be, it's not like the Ukraine, you know, the China can't just roll tanks into, you know, across the Tony Strait. Uh, it's going to be an air and naval battle. Uh, and it's predominantly going to rely on uh, how good other sides, air defense radar and the uh, air defense missile systems that are attached to that radar, uh, how good those are. That's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for more than a year. Here's what to look out for in our second half. With midterm elections around the corner, we bring you a roundup of Washington's China policy highlights under the current and former administrations. How did Trump deal with threats from the communist regime? And what steps has Biden taken after taking over? From trade to Taiwan, plus technology and diplomacy, a look at the big picture only on NTD. The full episode is available on our partner platform, Epoch TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. See you tomorrow. Shen Yun Creations, the streaming platform from Shen Yun, featuring world class dance, past programs, and all original music. Masterclasses, behind the scenes, comedy, and more. Explore Shenyuncreations.com.